to this committee and to respond to your questions on the important topic of oral health and the introduction of the Canadian Dental Care Plan. Why is this issue so important? Dental decay is the most common non-communicable disease in the world. It is caused by sugar and is completely preventable. It results in pain and infection and thousands of people visiting hospital emergency rooms every year and taking time off work and time off school. It is the most common reason young children in Canada need to have a general anaesthetic. Like many diseases, the poorest and most marginalized Canadians have much more dental decay than wealthier Canadians. At the same time, the poorest and most marginalized Canadians often have no dental insurance and cannot afford dental care. This is why the CDCP is so important. There are many Canadians with oral diseases who cannot afford oral health care even when they are in pain. My example was dental decay, but gum disease is also very common, and many Canadians have missing teeth affecting their ability to eat, to smile, to socialize, and to work. On top of this, many seniors in long-term care centers who are unable to clean their mouths are at risk of catching pneumonia and dying because of accumulated dirt in their mouths. Also, rates of cancer of the mouth and throat are increasing in Canada. Oral health is health. Oral health care is health care. It is very important that we put the mouth back in the body and reverse this historical anachronism, and the CDCP is an excellent first step in this direction. Among OECD countries, Canada had nearly the lowest level of publicly funded dental care, even lower than our neighbours to the south. The WHO recently published its Global Oral Health Action Plan, stating, among other things, that countries should integrate oral health care in universal health care, and Canada is now moving in that direction. So how can the CDCP help Canadians? It now means that the poorest and most marginalized Canadians can obtain a good range of oral health care. It means young kids can obtain timely care to prevent dental decay and not be subject to a general anesthetic. It means seniors living in long-term care centres can be more easily visited by an oral health professional to have their mouths cleaned. It means that people at risk of mouth and throat cancer can be seen more regularly by health professionals who are expert in caring for the mouth and so can be diagnosed and treated earlier. However, there are limits of the CDCP. While cost is the largest barrier to dental care, it is not the only one. The CDCP is an excellent first step in addressing cost, but it does not deal with other barriers. For instance, many seniors living in long-term care centers have limited mobility, so providing dental clinics and or mobile dental care in those centers is important. People with a broad range of disabilities have difficulty accessing dental care services that can accommodate their wheelchair or their hearing problem, or their communication problem, or their multiple other health issues making their dental care complex. Many people live in rural and remote areas with no dental services and need both mobile dental care, teledentistry services, and care integrated with other health services they receive. Oral diseases are the, have the same causes and occur in the same people who have a range of other chronic diseases, such as diabetes, heart disease, asthma, arthritis, cancer, and dementia. These people often access community health centers for a range of health and social services. Dental care needs to be integrated in these community centers on a large scale. And an unfortunate, unintended consequence of the CDCP is that university and college clinics where dentists, dental hygienists, and dentists are trained, used to be primary sites for dental care for people who had problems, problems accessing dental care. But the CDCP now means that many of them can now access that care more quickly in private offices. So the CDCP is inadvertently depriving future oral health care professionals of essential training opportunities. This issue needs to be urgently addressed. So what needs to be addressed? done to address the non-cost barriers. We need to better integrate dental care with health care in community health centers, long-term care settings, and hospitals. We need to better train oral professionals to care for people with more complex oral health care needs and to provide a broader range of services using modern technology in a broader range of settings. 
We need to recognize that caring for a person with, for instance, Alzheimer's disease is more complicated and takes more time than caring for health, a healthy adult, and so alternative additional compensation models for the professionals providing those services need to be developed. We need to use the Statistics Canada data, sorry, the data that Statistics Canada is collecting to evaluate the new CDCP services so we can adjust them as needed. And we need to better integrate the university and college dental training programs into the CDCP related activities so they can train personnel appropriately in a range of settings and develop, test and evaluate programs to address the non-financial barriers to dental care that I previously outlined. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Allison. It will be a lot of time for members' questions. Uh, now we're going to hear from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and uh, Mr. Kelly, please. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, it is good to be with you all. I'm coming to you from Calgary today. Uh, I was in Ottawa earlier this week, so budgets are fresh on my mind. I was there to uh, to review the provisions of the 2024 budget. Uh, so it's been a busy week uh, for you and for me on that front. Uh, I, I do want to just note that small firms, small and medium-sized businesses, which are the members, uh, which are members of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, they remain at this moment very fragile. There are lots of concerns, lots of worries about the months ahead. Uh, many businesses have been hanging on uh, by a thread over the last number of months, and, and it takes very little, sadly, to push them over. Uh, I do think we should all pay attention very, very closely to what's happening with respect to both business closures and business startups right now. We have huge numbers of business closures up uh, dramatically from previous years. Uh, and we have now, for the first time over several months, for the first time in recorded history, we have more businesses closing than businesses opening. Uh, and that is a very worrisome trend across Canada. Uh, there, in recent days, some of our data at CFIB d does show a little bit of a glimmer of hope on the horizon. I think uh, hopefully with uh, potential of some lower interest rates that, that may uh, provide some help to small and medium-sized companies. But we also have to put that in the context of what's happened over the course of the past few months where there have been four tax increases, four federal tax increases uh, since January 1st, uh, an increase in Canada pension plan premiums, an increase in employment insurance premiums, an increase, of course, a significant one in the carbon tax on April the 1st, and an increase, a more modest one, but an increase nonetheless on liquor taxes across Canada. On the substance of the piece of legislation, Bill C-59, C there are kind of three big categories that, uh, that we've paid attention to. Um, one of them is on intergener intergenerational business transfers, uh, the other on employee ownership trusts, and third, the amendments to the Competition Act. All three of these files, the legislation does, I think, move the ball forward. We were pleased that uh, the intergenerational business transfers, the legislative changes that are being proposed don't seem to dramatically veer from the intent of the private members bill that was adopted by the House of Commons, so that is a good thing. Um, but we do worry that there is a lot of administrative procedures that uh, that may be gumming up the ranks. Uh, some, uh, some tax officials, sorry, tax uh, experts have told us that that really are there going to be 12 tests, 12 different tests to determine the legitimacy of an intergenerational business transfer. I, I do worry about the red tape and paperwork that we are creating through that process, recognizing that, that, uh, that we want to make sure that these are valid transfers nonetheless. On employee ownership trusts, there has been some, some uh, positive momentum, both in the, uh, in the subject of Bill C-59 and in uh, just this week's budget. Uh, we are particularly encouraged by the allocation of a capital gains uh, exemption of up to $10 million in transferring a business. That's not in this legislation, but, but I imagine will be in the budget implementation of the current budget. Uh, and that is good news. We think that this is a good pathway for small and medium-sized firms and are pleased to see this moving forward. Uh, also, there are some good amendments to the Competition Act. Canada has fairly weak competition laws, generally speaking. Small firms really do need strong competition law to prevent the creation of, of monopolies and oligopolies, uh, and some of the amendments that have been proposed, uh, we do support. Uh, I'll leave it there. Lots. I, I, I suspect I may get a question or two about uh, the 2024 budget, but uh, happy to take any of your questions on this or, or the previous one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly. And I'm sure there are going to there will be many questions. Uh, so. 
We are moving to members' questions right now, and uh, so it will be uh, six minutes for each party at, uh, in this first round. I understand it's going to be MP Ellis that will be asking questions for the first six minutes. MP Ellis. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for being here. <clears throat> Dr. Allison, you talked a, a bit about the Canada Dental Care Program, which is going to cost Canadians billions of dollars, of course. Uh, how many Canadian children currently have access to provincial and or territorial dental plans? Well, it varies enormously across the, the provinces and territories. Um, so I can say, for instance, in Quebec, where I work, uh, children up to their 10th uh, birthday have access to uh, uh, dental care. But, but across the other provinces, it varies uh, a lot. So, Thanks very much. Through you, Chair. It's uh, PEI, Nunavut, Newfoundland, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and Yukon have children's programs. <clears throat> that being said, uh, through you again, Chair, uh, to you, Dr. Allison, do uh, you know how many dentists uh, have signed up for the Canadian Dental Care Program at the current time? I, I don't know. I, I read in the media that it's approximately 5,000. Uh, thank you very much. And through you, Chair, specifically in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and PEI, uh, Dr. Allison, do you know those numbers at all? I do not. Uh, thank you very much. And, and through you, Chair, uh, that would be eight out of 1,170 dentists. Are you aware of that number, sir? I was not. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Through you, Chair, uh, Dr. Allison, could you give any thoughts around why... Uh, are, are, sorry, sir, are you still a practicing dentist? I am not. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Um, but could you give any thoughts, uh, in spite of that fact that you're not practicing, as to why a dentist might not sign up for the Canadian Dental Care Program? Well, I believe that it's a, it's a very large change in the dental care practice in the country. Um, and uh, dentists and dental hygienists and dentists have been used to dealing with uh, private dental insurance pr primarily. Um, and so now they're going to have to deal with uh, the, the federal government through this. That's a very large change. It's a very large change in uh, the way they're uh, dealing with things. So I think any time there's a significant change, any uh, group of people uh, are cautious. They want to know the details. Um, so it's quite understandable that they're hesitant to sign up until they understand the details of the program uh, fully. Thank you very much for that. Through you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Allison, do you know how many dentists were consulted before the Canadian Dental Care Program was created? I do not. Thank you very much. That would be a zero, actually. Uh, and through uh, through you, Chair, um, you know we talked. Uh, you talked a little bit about a new program, but does this not uh, this new uh, idea actually create a different relationship between the dentist and the patient? Uh, primarily, uh, sorry about that, interpreters. Primarily, um, we would expect that the relationship would be, be be between a primary health provider like a dentist and the patient. My understanding from speaking to all the dental associations across this country is that now that relationship is between the dentist and the uh, the federal government. Do you understand that to be true as well, sir? Um, I don't understand that to be true. Uh, as far as I can understand, there's a relationship. There's always a three-way relationship. There's the patient, um, the uh, dentist or the dental provider, and the insurance company. Uh, assuming there's an insurance company involved. Now, uh, so now the, instead of the insurance company, there will be a government involved. So there is sometimes a third party involved in, in the situation. Thank you very much. And through you, Chair, uh, Dr. Allison, do you know how many, uh, have you talked to any dentists about this program? I have. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much. And through you, Chair, have you talked to them specifically about this change in relationship? Have any of them brought about that concern to you? Because they've brought it up to me. They have not brought that concern to me, no. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, how much more time do I have left, Chair? You have two and a bit minutes. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and through you, if I may, uh, to you, Dr. Allison, again, uh, do you know how many Canadians don't have access to a primary care provider in Canada? Primary dental care provider? No, primary health care provider. Family doctor, let's say that. I don't know. Yeah. It's uh, six and a half million Canadians. Yeah. Uh, when we look at this, uh, this idea that, is, that has come forward, and we hear, of course, a multitude of Canadian dentists 
who are refusing to sign up for this program. There's 26,500 dentists in Canada. Uh, the greatest number, uh, through the research that I've done myself last week, would indicate that 400 out of 4,000 dentists are signing up uh, for the program of British Columbia. Does that indicate to you that there's a significant problem here, sir? It indicates that uh, there's lots of people who are cautious to sign up, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I, that wasn't exactly the question I asked. So maybe I'll try again. Do you think there's a significant problem with the Canada Dental Care Program with dentists are not signing up for it? So if they need to sign up with it, which, which I, apparently they do not need to sign up with it, uh, then I don't see that it's a problem. Uh, thank you very much. And I, uh, you know, certainly... Uh, there may be changes to come, but the changes have not happened. So I, I would appreciate that. I don't want to call your integrity into question. That's not what I'm doing. Uh, but suggesting that the things have changed when they have not yet to change, that's not entirely true, is it, sir? Well, what I read in a communication that was sent out by my understanding by Health Canada yesterday indicated that dentists would no longer need to sign up for the, um, uh, the program. And thank you very much. And, and through you, Chair, sir, could you provide the date on which that is uh, touted to happen? Sorry, I don't understand. The, the date on which the dentists will no longer have to sign up for this program. I don't know. I understood the communication. That's July. Well, that's the time, MP Ellis. July, uh, thank yeah. you. So we're going to go to MP Thompson, and I understand you'll be sharing your time with MP Baker. Yes. I will, thank, and thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to just clarify for the record, Newfoundland and Labrador, my uh, province, uh, does have a dental program for children, but it's certainly nowhere near the scope that is needed, so there's a huge gap there. Dr. Allison, um, we earlier today we heard from someone from the Canadian Society for Disabilities and Oral Health, and and she um, recommended um, th that dental care, which oral care, health care for um, disabled persons, um, become a specialty as a way to break down the barriers that um, the disabled population is encountering. You referenced um, integrated care and very much um, a specialized dental care. And, and through your opening remarks, I drew from that, that, that in, the, in my language, the places where people reside, if it's, if it's long-term care for seniors or community health centers in particular, which then lends itself to a primary health care model, where it's an integrated, multidisciplinary approach. Why in 2024 are we still struggling with an integration of oral health care with within primary health care, how do we bring the medical schools forward, the dental schools forward, so that we truly see this as wraparound primary essential care? Well, as I referred to in my opening remarks, we have this unfortunate anachronism where we have uh, separate uh, doctors for the mouth compared to the rest of the body, and that reflects all elements of training and service delivery. And in Canada is not the only country, as I'm sure you're aware. It's, it's the model pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, in my view, that's an unfortunate model, and we should be bringing um, oral health care professionals to, into the primary health care team on a, uh, on a very large scale. There's no difference between, as I said in my remarks, between the causes of dental decay and the causes of many other chronic diseases. It's just how they are, they're manifest. Um, and so I think it's very relevant to have uh, oral health care professionals in primary health care teams in a range of settings, as I said. Uh, getting back to the, your, your issues around people with disabilities, uh, Clearly, we need to have models where people who care for those, the mouths of those people, go to them because often they have great difficulty getting into private offices um, or they can come to a, a local hospital, a local communi community health centre setting and the oral health pro professionals can go there. So I think on many, many fronts for people with complex diseases, um, and, and just young kids uh, and many people, the, going to the, the community health centre and getting oral health care there would be the best model. Thank you. Thank you. Baker, MP Baker. Thanks so much. Chair, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Three minutes. Um, I'd like to turn, if I could, to uh, Mr. Kelly. Um, Mr. Kelly, um, uh, first of all, if I may, given that 
2024, the 2024 budget was just released this week. Um, I must uh, thank you for your, uh, for your advocacy on the Canada carbon rebates for SMEs. Thank you for that. And I understand you work closely with the government on this, on this aspect, so thank you for that. Um, and the rebate for SMEs uh, is an accelerated return process to provide direct refunds to small and medium-sized businesses. Can you speak to, uh, speak to this and your views on the government broadening its eligibility rules? Sure, uh, happy to. It is very good news uh, that after five long years of wait, uh, small and medium-sized firms are going to see government make good on its commitment to, to rebate a small portion of carbon tax revenues back to SMEs. Uh, we estimate at CFIB that businesses, uh, businesses in general pay 40% of the cost of the carbon tax, but of course, uh, to date, they've received almost none of the revenue back uh, also, the two and a half billion that has been sitting on the books of the government of Canada obviously prevents the government from making a credible case uh, that the tax is, in fact, uh, revenue neutral. Uh, so it is really good news that the government is intending, I, I hope, later this year to give that money back to small businesses. The breakthrough really was, I think, though, expanding significantly the eligibility rules. Uh, under the previous scenario that was proposed by government uh, and planned for over the course of the past five years, the intention was to give the money back to emissions-intensive trade-exposed businesses only. Uh, the government documents suggest that that might have been only about 20,000 businesses. With the change that has been made, 600,000 small and medium-sized businesses will be receiving a portion back of carbon tax revenue, and that is certainly good news. We don't know the dollar amounts yet, uh, so we're waiting. There's a whole host of details that need to come back, uh, but but this is positive, and and we received it as such uh, as an element of the 2024 budget package. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, I think I've got about a minute left. Um, just sticking to the topic of of the budget, um, you've said uh, recently that most small business owners will come out ahead or be unaffected by capital gains changes in budget 2024. Can you explain the rationale for that point of view? Sure. Look, the, the small businesses look at capital gains from two perspectives. Primarily, our members, small and medium-sized companies, look at it from uh, look at the capital gains treatment when you sell your business. Most small business owners count on the sale price of their business to fund their own retirement. They don't have uh, pension plans uh, like uh, like other Canadians might. Uh, so on that front, the, it is very good news that the lifetime capital gains exemption will rise from one million to one point two five million. Plus, we are encouraged with the new entrepreneurs, Can Canadian Entrepreneur Incentive that will provide over a 10-year period up to $2 million at a lower capital gains treatment than before. Those two measures we think are positive. I will say there's a bunch of exceptions to this. And though, like, I got to tell you that Canadian Entrepreneurs accept, uh, Incentive is going to be an incredibly divisive policy because about half of Canada's small businesses, we estimate, a government has proposed would be ineligible for that additional $2 million. So we are quite worried about that. The other capital gains treatment, though, is capital gains within the corporation itself. And all of that now will be taxed at 67%. And we're certainly hearing from small, medium-sized businesses with significant worries about the increase in capital gains uh, where it comes in. Uh, there's no... Uh, there's no 250,000 at the kept at 50% for corporations. That's all going to be taxed now at 67%, and that is a worry, a big one for a lot of small businesses, particularly in uh, in startups and technology firms, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Now to MP Trudel, please. Merci, uh, Monsieur le Président, uh, Monsieur Kelly. Uh... Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to ask my first question to Mr. Kelly. So I'll start off with something rather general. Do you feel that the current uh, government policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis SMEs uh, is uh, fair? Or are they doing enough to help small and medium-sized businesses in Canada? Uh, no, I, I certainly don't. Uh, there have been uh, some advancements, including in the 2024 budget, uh, but sadly, there have been a host of government policies that really do set small businesses back. I mentioned at the beginning of my commentary the four tax hikes that we've seen just over the last four months. 
uh, that's not good for, for small and medium-sized firms. Small firms tend to be very payroll intensive. And with the increase in employment insurance premiums combined with the increase in, cap in CPP premiums, uh, that is a big worry uh, and, and has taken a toll out of the, uh, taken a big bite out of the uh, out of the payroll budgets of every business across Canada. Secondly, uh, we did see at the beginning of the year the Canada Emergency Business uh, Account deadline come and go. And while many businesses were successfully able to repay government by uh, coming up with the forty thousand dollars to repay their CBA loan, uh, many many did that. I think about a quarter of small businesses did that by borrowing from the bank. So government got its money back, but the business didn't get any of its debt relieved. Uh, other than the $20,000 forgivable portion. So they still have that loan now at higher rates of bank interest, uh, which is a big worry. Small firms, of course, over the course of the past uh, three years, uh, in the pandemic years, uh, were incredibly hard hit. Canada kept lockdowns in place longer than almost any other jurisdiction in the entire world. Uh, so small firms remain in retail, hospitality, the service sector, arts and entertainment, travel and tourism. They remain, remain desperately weakened. Uh, from the restrictions, um, and sadly, that damage, the debt that has been created and the, the lack of sales uh, has been a problem. Well, talking about the emergency, the CBA, uh, we don't have a, a report on that yet, but uh, we've worked very, very hard in Quebec to get something by January, 18th of January. We tried to push back uh, that deadline. Anyway, we've had reports that, uh, you know, the, the, the community of SMEs is very, very important to any economy. Ten, tens of thousands of individuals uh, went bankrupt uh, recently. So what's been the outcome for that? What are the repercussions? Starting to see the price uh, of of some of those policies and the lack of changes, we've been we were of course uh, very happy to have your party support for an increase in the SEBA deadline. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, but the consequences are significant. We are seeing right now higher business bankruptcies, dramatically higher business, not just bankruptcies but failures. And I will note. Um, and this often, I think, surprises people. When, when every for every one business that that actually goes bankrupt, there are nine other businesses that just quietly close their doors. We we believe bankruptcies represent essentially one in ten business closures. Most businesses just find an orderly way to close their doors, pay their bills, and and cease operations. It's heartbreaking to see uh, some of those businesses fail. Now, I will say business failure is an accepted part of being an entrepreneur. Businesses fail in good times and in bad times with good policy, government policies and bad government policies. But we are seeing such a dramatic rise in business bankruptcies and along with it, a reduction in the number of business startups. And those two things have not been seen together in the way that they're happening right now ever. Uh, so we have now a net outflow of business owners. I do worry that the, the, the back-end damage of the CBA loan program will push more over the edge. Uh, businesses are not going to make it, not because they're not viable businesses, but because they can't outrun their debt. Um, so it is good news that there is going to be some money coming back from the carbon tax rebate, long overdue. Uh, that, of course, isn't going to be in the case in Quebec or in British Columbia, but in the eight other provinces. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, we we are hoping that with with some of the some pieces of the capital gains changes that are positive, that may send a good message to some entrepreneurs. But I I, I do worry about where we're headed in Canada, and for small business owners, these are not easy days. Merci. Combien de temps, Monsieur le Président? How much time left? One minute. Good. Once again, Mr. Kelly in C59. There is uh, re some improvement in transgenerational or cross-generational uh, transfer uh, for agriculture or farms. Uh, to what, uh, how significant is this uh, to small business owners, transfer function? Generational transfers uh, are very significant. We have a massive exit of business owners, not because of business failures. The other big thing that is coming, the other demographic reality that is facing us as Canadians is the fact that many business owners are just getting older. Look, 
business owners often talk about their retirement uh, in in very different terms. I re- my favorite story, of course, is uh, a farmer who was just delighted that dad finally showed him the books of the company because he was the successor and was about to take it over. And the son in this story was 65. <laughs> and dad finally shared with his 65-year-old son the books of the operation so that he could take it over. This is a classic entrepreneurial story, but time runs out for business owners we have to make sure that the succession from one generation to the next is made successful. The reason this intergenerational uh, transfer, uh, these rules are so important is because we do want to make sure when people transfer their businesses to their kids, to people in the community, to their employees, there's a greater chance that that business will stay in that community rather than just be bought up by perhaps a big American company and the, that will be buying it for its client list or its product. And the jobs often disappear after that. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Yeah. Kelly. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. And uh, now MP Davies, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison, in a July 2023 editorial in the Canadian Journal of Public Health, you wrote the following. The Canadian Dental Care Plan is an excellent and much-needed step forward in reducing the considerable inequalities in access to dental care in Canada. But there remain a number of important further steps to be taken to more fully address those inequalities, as well as those in oral health and disease, including the possibility of making dental care part of Canada's universal coverage medical system. What uh, specific additional steps do you believe are necessary to further reduce inequalities in access to dental care beyond the CDCP? Well, as I alluded to in my uh, opening remarks and previous response, I think we need to uh, create uh, clinics and uh, uh, infrastructure in community health centres, in long-term care centres, in rural settings. We need to put uh, the facilities to provide dental care and the professionals where the people are who need them. At the moment, the model, is, uh, which works very well for most people, is that we set up a private office and people come to a private office in, in the normal way. That works for most of us, that's fine, but it doesn't work for lo- lots of people, and unfortunately for lots of people who are uh, with disabilities, who are uh, in rural and remote areas, uh, for very young kids, for seniors, etc. And they tend to be, and the poorest people, and they tend to be the people with the highest levels of disease. So we need to do that sort of thing uh, moving forward. Ultimately, in my uh, opinion, we should be making oral health care part of the medical uh, care system, just as all other p- parts of the body. Last point. Is there any principled reason or difference in care or diagnosis or, or um, uh, service that would differentiate oral care from any other health care of any other part of the body? No. Thank you. Um, Now, the the CDCP fees were set initially by the government at about 82% of provincial fee guides across the country. Now, you're aware the provincial fee guides are set unilaterally by the provincial dental associations, correct? Yes. So they set their own fees. Yes. Now, the 2024 CDCP fee guide has been amended to now approach about 88% of the provincial fee guides across the country. Were you aware of that? I was not, no. Okay. Do you think that the fees being under the provincial fee guides might be a reason that the provincial dental associations have been recommending to their dentists that they not sign up for this program? I can imagine that is the case, but I don't know. Okay. Um, Do you know how a rate of 88% of fee guides under the CDCP, if in fact that's the average, compares to provincial public dental care plan fee guides? I think it compares well with a lot of those fee guides, yes. Okay. Um, Now, in terms of dental schools, I visited the University of Alberta Dental School, a fabulous facility, by the way, um, and they told me that they need patients and that they generally charge their patients some fees, sometimes for just the supplies that have to be used. If they sign up for the CDCP... They can build the CDCP, thereby providing them with patients and probably increased revenue because at 88% of the fee guides, they're going to be getting sub- significantly more revenue than they're getting directly from the marginalized people who are paying them out of their pockets now. Uh, might that go some distance in allaying your concerns? 
It, that will definitely be helpful. The, the major problem, however, is that, uh, uh, as you will understand, when you come to a, uh, any training situation, whether it's the university dental schools or the colleges, uh, the care takes a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So if a person has the choice between going to uh, a training institution um, and getting their care free or, or much cheaper uh, versus going to a private mm -hmm. office and getting it done much more quickly, um, that's a real, that's a, it would be understandable if they go to the private office. And we have, in our dental schools, begun to see people say that they are going to do that. Right. So that is, uh, it's, a, it's a major concern that we have. How that's going to play out at this stage, mm -hmm. we are not quite sure, but we're already be beginning mm -hmm. to see that happen. Right. Yeah, that's definitely an issue we'll have to address. I mean, uh, certainly it's been addressed in every other medical profession uh, at medical school. M many other disciplines in medicine require, as part of the internship process, um, practicing on patients. And it, right, okay. Um, now, just um, to clear up a couple of, of inaccuracies, I'm going to read you a quote from the Canadian Dental Association. Uh, they confirmed this morning's meeting that they've been extensively consulted on the CDCP. This is their quote. Over the past two years, the CDA has been representing patients and the dental profession in conversations with Health Canada. CDA and the provincial and territorial dental associations provided information on what is needed to ensure optimal oral health care for all Canadians. Uh, were you aware of that? I was. And uh, dental hygienists has, have also been extensively consulted by the government uh, as part of their contribution to the CDCP. Were you aware of that? Yes. And uh, dentists uh, like Dr. Cooney, Dr. Quinones, Dr. James Taylor, who is, I think, Canada's dental officer, Do uh, Dr. Doucette, have all been extensively consulted by the government. Were you aware of that consultation by dentists? I was. Okay. You're also aware that, uh, as has been said by my colleague, uh, no, there's no requirement to sign up for the program that the first patients are only going to start going to the dentist in May. And now dentists will be able to bill on a claim-by-claim -claim basis starting in July. Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay. Do you think that the provincial associations advising their dentists not to sign up for the program until more details are known or until the fees are raised or they don't have to join the program, which were their demands were met, do you think that may be partially responsible for the lack of dentists signing up? I can imagine it is, yes. Mm -hmm. And are you aware that in Saskatchewan, when Tommy Douglas set up uh, health care in Saskatchewan in the 1940s, that the doctors in that province went on strike? I wasn't aware there was a strike, but I was aware there was a lot of resistance, yes. Yeah. I guess it sort of seems to be the case that when there's change like this, there's some resistance. Um, it's a time. Oh, thank but you. But what we're going to do now, because uh, I'm looking at the time, we have, a, again, a truncated uh, second round. It's going to be four minutes uh, per party, and uh, we're going to start with uh, MP Hallen for those uh, four minutes. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Mr. Kelly, since I, I don't have much time, I'm, I'll appreciate some short answers. Um, just a dollar amount. How much have your members received in carbon tax rebates today after five years? I just need the dollar amount. I think it's 31 million out of 2.5 billion that went back uh, in the first little bit of this, but basically there's 2.5, 2.6 billion sitting on the accounts in the government of Canada. Does this disprove this Liberal government's claim of the carbon tax being revenue neutral? There is no possible way you could claim the carbon tax is revenue neutral. Uh, while the government of Canada sits on two and a half billion dollars that is owed to small business. 82% of small businesses are saying to scrap the carbon tax, ax the tax altogether. Will you advocate for those small businesses today and, and agree with them? Uh, well, th th they speak for themselves. My association brings their data forward to you. And, and today, you're absolutely right. 82% of small businesses across Canada, through our most recent member touch point, oppose uh, the, the retail carbon tax as it exists today. I will add that that was just a year ago, only about 52% that opposed the carbon tax. And one of the main reasons that small firms have grown in their opposition to the carbon tax is the fact that the government hasn't delivered on the rebates after promising it for five straight years. Uh, so, Mr. Kelly, you represent many members. Are you saying that you won't advocate for that same thing? I'm sorry? Yeah, you, sorry, our, mem our member position, uh, our member's position is 
uh, right now get the, get no, the not, contacts. Not, not your member's position. I, I mean your association's position. Do you? Yeah, since well, you, that, my association's position is my member's position. I, I just have, wanted to make that clear. I have clear. no views other than them. And yes, and, but our Which member's position that? is, and, and mine, is uh, a strong majority of small firms uh, advocate to get rid of the retail carbon tax. Thank you. I'll uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Ellis, now. Thank you very much, and thank you, Chair. Uh, to you, Dr. Allison, back to the Canadian Dental Care Program. My colleague just mentioned that the uh, customary fees are increased from 82 to 80 percent, representing 6 percent of the budget of perhaps $13 billion, which equates to $780 million more million for this uh, botched program. Are you aware of the concept of balanced billing? I am. And would you suggest that uh, that margins are uh, quite wide open in dentistry, or are they very tight margins in terms of uh, costs for dentists are very high these days? I, I'm not aware of that. I don't work in dental practice. Oh, so uh, you've never talked to any dentists about having uh, difficulty paying their bills or that their overhead might be 75% to 80% of their gross billings? I have had conversations with uh, dentists about their practice, yes, some of whom talk about how well it's going and others talk about how... Uh, difficult it is. So, uh, sorry, are you well uh, aware of the concept of balanced billing? I am. And balanced billing would be, what would that be in a few words? It's when uh, the, uh, the provider asks the patient to ba uh, pay the balance over the insurance uh, or third-party payment. So uh, if I went out and uh, you and I were in line at the coffee shop and I bought a coffee and it was... Uh, uh, $3.60 and I asked you for the uh, other $3, that might be, uh, uh, or $0.60 cents even if I'm being kind, that would be kind of the same type of idea, right? I'm not sure I understood, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. Uh, that being said, uh, I think the other thing to, to suggest is, uh, you, some of your answers suggested that the associations were telling dentists not to sign up for, uh, for this program. Can you tell the, the committee exactly which dental associations you spoke to that told the members not to sign up? I, I didn't say that. Okay, well, I think we'll have to check the record on that. Uh, it was very clear that you answered in the affirmative when my colleague suggested to you that associations were telling dentists not to sign up for this program, which I believe is categorically untrue. <clears throat> so that being said, um, uh, the concept of balanced billing would mean that the amount not covered by the plan would have to be funded by the patient. Is that correct, sir? Uh, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, so... It, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so we are off to uh, MP Weiler now, please, for four-ish minutes. Thank you, Chair. And I do, I do want to thank um, Dr. Allison and Mr. Kelly for their uh, testimony already. Um, the biggest issue that I'm hearing from, from small businesses in, in my riding, uh, particularly in Whistler, Squamish, and the Sunshine Coast, is that they can't find workers. And they can't find workers because they can't find a place for their workers to live. And so, um, you know, they're very happy with the investments that are being made in housing and the launch of Canada's housing plan in uh, in this budget, which, uh, in, in my, my opinion, makes some pretty transformational changes in the way that housing is going to be built so that we can close the housing supply gap that we have. Um, and so my question to you, Mr. Kelly, is, um, you know, what type of an impact do you see this having on, on small businesses across Canada and being able to house workers? I, I, I can't say that we've done a detailed study of the specific initiatives uh, that are in this uh, in the in the new round of uh, announcements that have uh, come forward. But I will say that in our survey last year uh, related to the budget implementation, uh, the housing issues shot up as a as a concern on the part of employers faster than I've ever seen. Uh, this this I would have said five years ago. If you had asked small business owners how concerned were you about housing issues, they would have put that quite low on their list of priorities. But in the last couple of years, that has been quite high for the very reason that you're you're citing. The, their concern is uh, for their staff. If if they can't find workers, they don't have anyone then to work in their in their businesses. Uh, so finding measures to get more housing built across Canada is is something that small firms definitely support. The specific measures that have been taken, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, uh, I, I'm probably not able to qualify, uh, qualify to speak on the specific new measures as I've been focused on capital gains taxation and the and the carbon rebate. 
No, that's that's fair, and there's there's lots to uh, to digest in in the budget here. So uh, per perhaps the next time we're able to um, to have you on our committee, we can talk about that. Um, but you did mention in your opening for for taxes that had increased yeah. this year, including the modest increase in the the excise tax on on liquor. Yes. Um, but you didn't mention the at the same time that there is excise tax being cut in half on craft brewers, and I understand that about ninety four percent of brewers in Canada. Are below the fifteen thousand hectoliter threshold, where excise taxes are going to be cut in half. I know in, in my own riding, all but one brewery, um, and there are nine of them, uh, fall into that that, um, that threshold. And so I was I was wondering uh, what you're hearing from the impact of this um, this measure on those businesses. Uh, well, look, we we certainly uh, were were thrilled when the government did uh, uh, reduce the uh, the planned increase, the inflationary increase on 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 liquor excise taxes, um, and I think the measure that that was taken with respect to beer is a very positive one. You're absolutely right. Uh, for craft brewers, that is that is a big big deal. When we look at liquor taxes more broadly, though, we look at it not just on the effect on the brewers or the uh, or the producers of the alcohol products. But the you know the throughout the food chain on on the restaurants and bars and others that that use that uh, uh, use these products uh, sell these products and the markup that then they have to uh, to come up with so uh, that's why I was focusing on the broader issue of the uh, of the increase in the tax rate but the 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 beer uh, change was a very good one. Thank you and and just with my last question here you, you brought up the the CBA loans that uh, yeah. Um, that we had the repayment deadline earlier this year. I understand about 80% had been repaid right. by that time. Um, of the remainder that's that's kicked into other low interest loans or refinancing, do you have a sense of where the majority, like which which sector of small businesses are the majority yeah. of where those outstanding CBA loans are going to be? The the sectors that we know are having the hardest time if with repayment are retail, hospitality, the service sector, arts and entertainment, travel and tourism. These are the sectors that, of course, were enduring the lockdown measures the longest, uh, and of course have the probably the longest road to recovery. Uh, I will say though, uh, while it is good news that eighty percent of businesses did repay by the by the deadline. Um, I'll add that uh, the way that many of these businesses found the money to repay the bank SIBA loan was by taking out another bank loan, and in some cases putting the SIBA loan on their credit card in order to pay it off. Uh, so about a quarter of those that were able to repay their SIBA loan, which one is, you know, is a good thing, they got the forgivable portion, so that's positive, but they did so in an incredibly expensive way by borrowing to repay a loan. Um, and I likened that to, you know, uh, taking, you know, taking money out on your visa to to pay your MasterCard bill. It's not a great, that's not a great success from my perspective. Thank you. And thank you, MP Weiler. And now to uh, welcome uh, MP Samari. Yeah, good to see you. Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. Salutations à tous les collègues. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to be back. And I, I greet all my colleagues. My colleague, my questions will be for Mr. Kelly. Uh, now, uh, of course, I'm rever I'm rever I'm referring, pardon me, to the C-59, which is not the current budget we're discussing, but the one that was tabled last year. And my question will deal with uh, competition issues. Uh, would you agree with the changes that have been brought to bear in the Compet Competition Act? And if so, please expand on that. We, we do like uh, the, uh, some of the amendments to the competition uh, laws in Canada. This is a big deal for small firms. There's been so much consolidation. Small firms feel like they have very little bargaining power with uh, with some of the large oligopolies and monopolies that exist in Canada. So that it, it is good news uh, that we are starting to uh, strengthen Canada's competition laws across the country. Uh, mo excuse me, modernizing the merger re review regime uh, improving the effectiveness of anti, uh, you know, some of the investigations of anti-competitive conduct, strengthening the enforcement of, against abuse of dominance by by big companies, uh, as well as introducing right to repair uh, rules. These are these are some positive measures that that we saw uh, in 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 that. I will say that uh, you know we're, we're these are I would say fairly modest competition changes. These aren't 
these aren't big ones, but it is the first time in a long time that we've seen some additional teeth be put in competition law in Canada, and, and that is a good thing. We're going to have to test this out, uh, see how it works, and of course, we will, as an association, always give feedback back to government and all opposition parties like yours uh, as to how things are going. Merci pour votre réponse. Well, thank you for that answer. Uh, very nuanced. Uh, of course, it, the part of the on competition could have gone a little bit further uh, from what uh, you've said. Uh, what would your suggestions be to improve the bill uh, to improve the Competition Act? We do have a more detailed submission, and I'll uh, I'll be very pleased to send it uh, uh, to the committee to you uh, with some further recommendations on this front. Uh, but I will say. Uh, we do need to look at some of the uh, the U.S., for example, has uh, in, in many respects stronger competition rules than does Canada, uh, and so we've borrowed from a few of those approaches. I don't have the details in front of me. I, my apologies. Oui, donc, euh, pas de problème. No problem, and we'd appreciate receiving that well, as quickly as you can, of course, because we have to propose amendments in very short order, so uh, the sooner the better, and much appreciated. But once again, still in the field of the Competition Act, uh, there's been uh, a mention made of rights to, rights to repair, a right to repair or reparation. So the law could go further, but some people fear that uh, the, the way that that is uh, worded, it uh, serves the automobile uh, industry, and they'd say, oh, it would be too complicated to change our methods or methodology or protocols. So the right to repair uh, is no, not really their responsibility. What could we do to improve that? Uh Mr. Kelly, were you able to I'm, hear I'm that? I'm sorry that I, I did. The translator, uh, uh, my 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 French, uh, Monsieur Saint-Méry, Saint is not perfect, and uh, unfortunately, the, the the audio dropped off almost altogether. Who's for on the good, for the last uh, minute or so? Oh, okay. The translator, the tra the translation stopped, and then the audio altogether left. on the wrong channel, and I guess, so what we're going to ask is that, uh, uh, MP Samari, can you repeat your question and maybe, and let us know right away, uh, Mr. Kelly, if you're hearing it. Yeah. We don't. Okay, so I think this might be a, comp uh, <laughs> a real uh, fix-up between the large monopolies here and uh, the against the interest of SM, SMEs and against competition, perhaps. Uh, did I understand that correctly? Can you hear the interpreter, uh, Mr. Kelly? Okay, so my question to re-paraphrase in the part of the Co Competition Act, the right to repair. Do you have any comments? Please. Uh, this this is an issue that uh, that we've heard from several sectors of the economy that uh, where where the right the right to repair the rights to be able to access and and uh, and understand uh, for those that are doing the repair work also the the end user is very very important and with some of the market power that exists from some of the large guys uh, that isn't always uh, that isn't always provided so I know that the government has been making some changes in this area. Uh, and I think is trying to strike the right balance between proprietary information and uh, the ability for, for customers and those doing repair work to have access to some of this needed information. So I, I do think that there is progress. Uh, my level of detailed knowledge is, uh, it, 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 I think we have some other views that I can include in the letter that I'd send to you. Thank you. And thank you, MP Samari. And now to MP Davies, this will be the last four minutes of questions for these, uh, for these two witnesses. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison, again, you wrote in the Canadian Journal of Public Health, quote, it's important to understand that the proportion of Canadians reporting not visiting a dentist because of the cost has increased from 17% in 2007 to 28% in 2016. It's interesting to note that that's the term of the last Conservative government, actually. 
Um, furthermore, in 2018, Statistics Canada reported that 36.4% of Canadians had no dental insurance, and CAIHI data indicate that in 2019, the most recent normal pre-pandemic year for data, while total expenditure on dental care in Canada was $16.4 billion, only $1 billion, 6.2%, was publicly funded. By establishing the CDCP, some 9 million Canadians will be able to visit a dentist. What will be the long-term health and economic impacts of that program? In terms of health, uh, there will be lots of preventive measures that can be put into place amongst kids and amongst uh, all, all age groups, as seniors as well. So we're going to prevent lots of uh, diseases. Uh, that's going to reduce lots of costs of people who couldn't otherwise afford to get to the dentist going to the ER uh, and... Uh, taking the time from ERs, taking, have, receiving painkillers and antibiotics. Often those antibiotics are uh, some, uh, not going to be helpful. So we're contributing to anti antimicrobial resistance, which is a major public health problem as well, as the actual cost of that care. So uh, it's much better if uh, those people who need urgent dental care are able to get to the, the dentist, the dental hygienist and others that, that can, can provide it directly. So there's going to be lots of cost benefits, health benefits. There's going to be lots of social benefits in terms of people not taking as much time off school and work. So when my grandma said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, she may have been on to something. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Mr. Kelly... Um, in, um, on February 27, 2024, the Calgary and Edmonton Chambers of Commerce issued a joint statement calling on the government of Alberta to discuss the viability of a federal pharmacare plan in their province. They said, quote, with the ongoing labour shortage and need to attract talent and the cost to employers for providing health-related benefits, along with the financial benefit of pooling resources across provinces, a national pharmacare program, if developed well, could benefit Alberta's economy. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, this has been a tricky issue. Uh, in member surveys, we do get mixed views from small business owners. Uh, there's no question that some do see uh, many small firms struggle to have employee benefits plans that would be anywhere close to as generous as uh, positions in government or or in large corporations. And so there could be an equalizing effect if uh, if it, with, the, with the creation of these programs. In some cases, employers are happy to dump their costs onto government, and uh, and 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 I do worry that that <laughs> that 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 may happen with some com with some companies just basically exiting uh, the provision of, uh, of 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 coverage, and and yeah, as government picks up the tab. Um, the but the other big thing that business owners know is that with all of these major programmatic changes, uh, there are new costs, and we know that that often governments look to small and medium-sized businesses to pick up these costs, uh, as we've seen in recent days. So it, is, it isn't an easy calculation. I think the in the last member survey that I showed, there was mixed support Mr. for the addition of pharmacare. Mr. Kelly, I've, I've limited time. Um, you actually put a survey out in 2019, the CFIB, that highlighted that 47% of business owners are in favour of introducing pharmacare, while only 27% expressed opposition. Uh, that's about a two to one margin. Is that correct? Is that what the survey the uh, survey showed? You have you have that survey in, in front of you, and I, I trust that that data is correct. Uh, yeah, it, it, I would say a two to one ratio is is supportive. We we don't have price tags in front of small business owners, so there is that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, MP Davies. That that is it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kelly, Dr. Allison. Uh, thank you for your remarks, for your testimony, for the many questions that uh, you answered. Much appreciative on behalf of the committee and the committee members. Uh, and we wish you the best with the rest of uh, of your day. So thank you very much. At this time, we're going to uh, transition to our next panel of uh, witnesses. We're, so we're suspended.